And the Stockholm Seminars, just to give you a bit of background, uh, is a seminar organized by multiple organizations here at the Stockholm, uh, at the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, and organized by Alba Eco, Stockholm Resilience Center, Bayer Institute of Ecological Economics, Future Earth, and the Swedish Secretariat for Environmental Earth System Sciences. And for this special occasion, also in collaboration with the Stockholm Environmental Law and Policy Center. That was a long intro. Um, we're very pleased and honored to welcome Professor John Knox, uh, who is a professor of international law at Wake Forest University, uh, USA. And Professor Knox is also the first UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment. So what we will hear uh, is a presenta presentation from Professor Knox and also two uh, additional uh, reflections from uh, Jonas Ebeson, Professor Law and Dean at the Faculty of Law, Stockholm University. Hopefully you will share also some insights from the ongoing lawsuit against Bo Eden and activities in Chile, my home country. Uh, and then we also have uh, Claudia Ipartelima, Doctor uh, Claudia Ipartelima, who's an international environmental law advisor for Swedbio at the Stockholm Business Center. So Professor Knox will give an introduction or a longer talk for about half an hour, and then we will have two invited reflections, and in the end, 15 minutes or so for comments and discussions with the audience. So we will end at one o'clock. That's the plan. So, Professor Knox, yes. Okay, so thank you very, <coughs> excuse me, thank you very much for that introduction and for the invitation to be here. It's a great honor for me to be speaking with you today. Um, so, as you just heard, I'll describe first my mandate um, on the United Nations uh, mandate on human rights and the environment, and then I'll describe a little bit uh, one application of that mandate to biodiversity conservation in particular. So I am, as you heard, a special rapporteur appointed by the United Nations Human Rights Council. That's the principal United Nations human rights body. It's composed of 47 governments who, in, who themselves are elected by the United Nations General Assembly. This is the, a picture of where the United Nations Human Rights Council meets in the Palais des Nations in Geneva. Um, as you can tell, uh, it's a, it's a rather interesting looking room. It has this kind of interesting looking ceiling, which is actually a work of art in itself. It was commissioned by a Spanish artist. And as I said yesterday, when I first began doing this work and spending a lot of time in this room in particular, I was sometimes distracted by the ceiling, which looks as if it's going to actually fall on people. It's uh, stalactites, I guess. It's, um, it has very symbolic import, I guess. But what I was really struck by is it the feeling that some of the people sitting under it might be in danger of being struck if one of these stalactites was released and somehow fell on them. But as I said yesterday, over time, and because United Nations meetings sometimes are not the most interesting, people tend to drone on, sometimes it actually uh, is nice to have the distraction of wondering, well, who would it hit if it fell? <laughs> and would it, in fact, in this current intervention. I mean, is it above the French delegate? Like, what would it take? To have it um, I'm just kidding. I don't really hope for that to happen. So, in March 2012, the United Nations Human Rights Council began this mandate by adopting a resolution, Resolution 1910, um, that decided to appoint an independent expert to do two main things study the human rights obligations relating to the enjoyment of a safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environment, and to identify best practices in the use of such obligations. Why did the Human Rights Council decide at this point to adopt this resolution? Why and, and why did they decide just to study this relationship? Well, part of the reason is that historically, environment has not really been on the international human rights agenda. Going back to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights adopted in 1948, here being held by the chair of the Human Rights Commission that drafted it, Eleanor Roosevelt, um, human rights is understood to include quite a wide variety of things, civil and political rights here on the left, like life, liberty, security of person, freedom of expression, and economic, social, and cultural rights, like the highest attainable standard of health and an adequate standard of living. What you don't see anywhere in that list is the environment. Um, this word cloud of the Universal Declaration does not 
include any reference, no matter how tiny, to the environment. This is, of course, not because Eleanor Roosevelt and her colleagues considered including the environment and rejected the idea. It's simply because the modern environmental movement still had 20 years um, before it would arrive. And so the Universal Declaration and its successors, the International Covenants on Civil and Political Rights and on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, just don't really talk about the environment. And this put the United Nations at something of a disadvantage for years, even despite the fact that the right to a healthy environment was increasingly recognized at the, at the national level. Most of the countries in the world now, this is actually, this was as of 2012, but several more countries have joined since then. At least 100 countries in the world now explicitly recognize a right to a healthy environment in their national constitution. But the United Nations still doesn't. Instead, what happened at the international level is that advocates, human rights and environmental advocates, began to bring environmental cases to international human rights tribunals. This um, is a picture of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights in Costa Rica, but they brought cases to the European Court, the Inter-American System, the African System. They also brought cases to special rapporteurs, to treaty bodies that oversee the major human rights treaties, um, like here, the Human Rights Committee that oversees the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and my soon-to-be colleagues, special rapporteurs on the right to health, the right to food, and so forth. And what these people and institutions began to do is essentially green existing human rights. They would take existing human rights, like the rights to life and health, and apply them to environmental problems. How would they do that? Essentially, the advocates would make the case that this environmental harm interfered with the enjoyment of this particular human right, the right to life, or the right to health, or the right to property, and so forth. And human rights bodies increasingly agreed with that and said, yes, in fact, that's true. And so as a result, a kind of body of environmental human rights jurisprudence began to build up. And so for about 20 years, really, from the 1990s to the to let's say 2010, 2012, this body had grown. And the Human Rights Council, led by governments like Costa Rica, the Maldives, Switzerland, realized that the United Nations really had become a laggard. It was behind in this area. And so it appointed, eventually, me um, as an independent expert to study this area and make recommendations back to the council. So I spent two years holding consultations around the world and doing a lot of research, and essentially tried to map everything that human rights bodies had said about environmental issues. And I have a series of reports, 14, 15 reports, that map out these obligations. It's hundreds of pages of long. But if I had to distill it all down to two sentences that fit on a PowerPoint slide, these would be without those tools, it becomes very difficult to have a healthy environment without the ability to find out what's going on, to complain to courts, to push through new policies, and to, fee and to speak freely and effectively about these issues, it becomes impossible, really, to ensure that your government is taking the steps necessary to protect the environment. So I presented that report to the council in March 2014. In March 2015, I addressed the second aspect of the mandate. Um, I, through these consultations and research, had developed uh, or, or recognized more than 100 good practices in the use of these obligations. And with, again, with the help of others, I, um, I put them into an online database, this environmental rights database, that is just an easily searchable online resource that identifies and describes good practices in a wide variety of areas, including rights to information, participation, non-discrimination, protection of indigenous rights, and so forth. So that was the end of my first three-year term as the mandate holder. In March 2015, the Human Rights Council decided to renew the mandate for another three years and changed my title to Special Rapporteur. And as I said yesterday, this is some, I'm sometimes asked, well, isn't this a promotion? Um, is your salary gone up or something? And in fact, um, it stayed at zero, which was what my salary was as an independent expert, because the whole idea here is that we're not UN employees, we're independent experts. Um, but I did regard it as a promotion actually for the mandate, not for me personally, but for the mandate, because it indicated that the council actually did recognize that these obligations now were clear enough 
that the mandate holder could do more than simply try to study them, but I could actually try and promote their implementation and compliance, which is what most special rapporteurs in this area do. Most special rapporteurs, I should say, appointed by the Human Rights Council do. So the special rapporteur on torture doesn't just study the obligations, he, he promotes compliance with them. And so this resolution is, is, is very important and significant because it changes the nature of the mandate from one that's just conceptual to one that's more about promotion of implementation. And it, in UN language, what, the way they did that is to ask me to promote and report on the realization of these human rights obligations and to work on identifying challenges and obstacles to their full realization. So going forward then, I had two tracks for this mandate. One was to do this promotion of implementation, and another was to continue to study the application of these obligations in particular areas. So in the first track, um, the implementation track, I've done a variety of things, which if we had more time I could discuss. I go on country visits, I receive communications, I worked with UN Environment and the UN Development Program um, to further implementation at their level, I've held judicial workshops, and so forth. Perhaps the most important thing I've, I'm trying to do in this implementation area is draft guidelines on human rights and the environment that summarize the human rights obligations that states owe in this area. I presented those guidelines last month in draft. I just came from Geneva where I had discussions with governments and the public and experts on the, the draft um, guidelines, and I'm going to finalize them for my next report and my final report to the Human Rights Council in March of 2018. Um, I'll just briefly describe them. States have general obligations, I explained the guidelines, to prevent, reduce, and remedy environmental harm. That's kind of a catch-all um, uh, general obligation. More specifically, they have to respect and protect human rights in actions they take to fulfill environmental challenges. This is something states sometimes overlook. They think, well, as long as we're acting to protect the environment, we don't really have to worry too much about the human rights we might interfere with along the way. That's not true. If you're undertaking a renewable energy project to reduce carbon pollution, you still have to make sure that you're respecting the human rights of those that are most directly affected. Another overarching obligation is one of non-discrimination. I, I feel like I'm rushing a little bit through these, not because they're not important, but because I just don't want to take up all my time on them, but we can certainly talk more about each of these. Um, they have a set of procedural obligations, which include obligations that I already mentioned with respect to information, participation, and remedy. They include obligations to protect human rights defenders working in the field of the environment. Um, and, and all of those obligations, again, are based on existing human rights forms. They don't require new intergovernmental negotiation. Governments already owe these obligations. They also have substantive obligations, although the here states do have more discretion. No one expects um, Madagascar to have exactly the same environmental standards as Sweden, for example. They're in different places in their economic development. However, Madagascar, like Sweden, should try not to go backwards. Madagascar should try to take into account international uh, standards for health and safety. Um, and with respect to the other standards here, all states, no matter what their level of economic development, should work together to address transboundary and global issues. They should take into account human rights obligations in implementing the sustainable development norms. And with respect to internationally financed projects, they have an obligation to make sure that those projects uh, specifically don't violate human rights. Finally, the guidelines will include a set of obligations relating to vulnerable groups or groups in vulnerable situations. States have to identify groups that are vulnerable to environmental harm. And again, PowerPoints don't allow much detail about this, but also groups that for regions of mar reasons of marginalization face barriers in exercising their human rights. And they have to take steps to address those barriers to remove them. So that, for example, groups that are historically not able to participate fully in decision-making steps have to do more with respect to those groups than with respect to their general population. And then finally, the rights of indigenous peoples and local communities that are similar to indigenous peoples, like Afro-descendant populations and, and um, tribal communities in Latin America, um, states have to recognize and protect their rights, including their rights to be able to essentially veto projects that uh, take place in their ancestral territory 
uh, without their permission. So that is the right of free, prior, and informed consent um, with respect to those projects has to be respected. All right. So I ask for comments um, in writing on this, and you're welcome to provide comments as well. Um, more information can be found on my United Nations website, and then comments can be provided by November 11th. And again, then I'll turn these into a final, final form. So with respect to the second track of the mandate, the continued clarification of the application of these obligations to particular areas, in March 2016, I prepared or submitted a report to the Council on Climate Change and Human Rights. I spent much of 2015 working on these issues in the run-up to the Paris Agreement, and so my report to the Council was essentially a report on those activities. My most recent report is on conservation of biodiversity and human rights, and perhaps here I can go into a little bit more detail to explain um, the nature of the relationship and how states are doing uh, in, in implementing their obligations in this respect. Um, so first, what is biodiversity? Just Briefly, the definition in the Convention on Biological Diversity is the variability among living organisms from all sources, including ecosystems and the ecological complexes of which they're part. So it includes diversity within species, between species, and of ecosystems. In other words, it's about as broad as you can possibly draw the, the term around biodiversity. Um, and in my report, I try to explain that human well-being depends on ecosystem services. We all depend on the services that ecosystems provide to have a healthy environment. Since ecosystem services depend on ecosystem, uh, healthy ecosystems, and healthy ecosystems depend on biodiversity, human well-being therefore depends on biodiversity. This is, of course, not an original concept with me. I'm simply repeating what many scientists and others have pointed out for many years. But what my report does do is put all this in human rights terms. That um, as the Millennium Ecosystem uh, Assessment of 2005 says, everyone in the world depends completely on Earth's ecosystems um, and the services they provide, such as food, water, spiritual fulfillment, etc. Well, all of these resources, all of these benefits can be put in human rights terms. Um, in human rights terms, we'd refer to the right to food, the right to water, the right to enjoy your culture. Biodiversity supports all of these rights by making ecosystems more productive, more stable, more resilient. And my report briefly describes some of the benefits that ecosystem services and biodiversity provide in human rights terms. So that, for example, the right to health is supported by the enormous variety of medicinal services that we get from biodiversity, that we, that we um, essentially draw on as a kind of vast storehouse, the immense biodiverse assortment of, of medicinal plants and other, um, and, and, and other um, elements of biodiversity. So, for example, the rosy periwinkle, the flower in Madagascar um, that was long used as a kind of a native traditional medicine in the 1960s, scientists studied it and realized that it could be used for um, the treatment of childhood leukemia. Childhood leukemia in the 1950s was one of the deadliest forms of cancer. It now is eminently survivable, not because humans invented some kind of synthetic uh, medicine out of nowhere, but because humans realized that nature had already provided us the remedy for it. Of course, I don't want to discount the effort that it took to turn that into the medicine, but the point is without that, that kind of basic data that, that was present in the biodiversity, that would have not been possible. It's also been used very successfully to treat Hodgkin's disease. Um, purple foxglove is treated, uh, used to treat um, heart disease. And there, the examples just, there are literally countless examples of, of how we've done this. Um, the right to health is also protected and supported by biodiversity. Scientists are increasingly discovering through a less obvious way, and that is the interaction between our own personal ecosystems, the little ecosystem each of us carries around with us of bacteria um, and microorganisms that allows us, for example, to respond to infections effectively, um, that we, those, that our own ecosystems are being adversely affected by the decrease in biodiversity in the external ecosystem. So our immune systems are becoming less robust. We're more susceptible to autoimmune diseases, for example, because we're so much less exposed to a biodiverse ecosystem around us. Um, 
I could go on and talk about the links to the right to food, the right to water, and so forth. But the point here is simple, I think, which is that because we depend so much on a healthy ecosystem uh, and healthy, uh, diverse uh, biological structure underneath that, um, that it's incumbent upon governments to do things that protect that system, that protect biodiversity. And so my report also discusses how well governments are doing in that respect. Um, in 2010, the parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity adopted the Strategic Plan for Biodiversity, which includes 20 targets, known as the IHE targets. For example, target five is to at least have, and where feasible, bring close to zero the rate of loss of natural habitats. Um, target 11 is to establish a target of 17% for essentially protected areas on land and 10% for protected areas and marine and coastal uh, areas. And this is all to be done by 2020, which is no, no longer that far away. So in my report, I discuss how well states are doing in this respect, and it will probably not surprise you to learn that they are doing miserably. Um, the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity issued a report recently which essentially assessed how well states were doing at the midpoint mark uh, toward reaching these targets. This is just one example of that. They have a nice little visual chart to to illustrate this, this, um, this gray arc shows the path towards full implementation of the target. And so therefore, if you're doing better than this, the arrow would be above it. As you can see, with respect to preventing the extension of known threatened species, um, a rather important target in this area, uh, this line means that we've made no progress whatsoever over the first five years of this target. Um, with respect to improving the conservation status of the species most in decline, we're actually worse off now than we were in 2010. We've gone backwards on that target. So my report explains, using this and a number of other measures, that in fact we're in a biodiversity crisis. Um, this, is a, this is an index from the, World, uh, from the World Wildlife Foundation. They essentially uh, look at how many how many members there are of various species, various vertebrate species as of 1970. They've monitored it ever since. Um, what they show here is that basically we've lost about half of those species. Not the species, I should say. It's not a measure of how many species we've lost, but how many members of those species we've lost. So as a result, some populations, many populations of species are getting more and more depleted, which of course brings them closer and closer to extinction. There are some famous examples of species, or examples I should say that should be more famous, um, of species that have been pushed over the edge just in the last year or two. This is a Bramble K. Malomus who uh, has the distinction, or had the distinction, of being the only vertebrate species native to the Great Barrier Reef. Um, I'm sorry, the only mammal species native to the Great Barrier Reef. It's found on one little island in the Great Barrier Reef. It now has the distinction of being the first species known to become extinct as a result of climate change. Climate change is causing ocean levels to rise, and the inundation with seawater has wiped out the habitat of the anomalous and no longer exists. So scientists formally decided it was extinct um, last year. What are we losing? You could say, well, what difference does that make? Um, here's an example of a species that went extinct in the 1980s, the gastric brooding frog. It had the distinction of actually holding its, its um, newborn animals in its stomach and then essentially, I guess, kind of spitting them out when they reach the point of birth. Um, sometimes we tell our children, you know, your babies grow in mommy's tummy. Well, for this frog, that is actually exactly what happened. Um, scientists were very interested in this. How is it that this frog is able to do this? If you're, if you're someone who suffer, suffers from gastric problems, for example, or someone who knows someone who's suffering from stomach cancer or something like that, understanding how it is that this system works is fascinating, but we can't study it anymore because it became extinct before scientists were really able to, to understand how it worked. Other species, um, I mean, sometimes we think of this as mainly affecting species we've never really heard of. It's too bad, but, you know, these are mainly insects, and what is the Malonis anyway? It looks kind of like a rat. Do we really need more of them? And so forth. Well, another way of looking at this is that the species you know and love are also in, at risk. The lemur, one of the most fascinating mammals in the world, is also the most at-risk mammal in the world. Found only on the island of Madagascar, more than 100 species of lemur. And all shapes and sizes, for well not all shapes, but all sizes from 
very large to extremely tiny, they're all at risk. The silky sapaka, a particularly beautiful type of lemur, is down to about 120, 150 members. We're going to start seeing more and more extinctions of the kinds of animals that kids have on their calendars and coloring books. Um, Okay, so in my report, again, I'll compress, I know I'm already over time. Uh, in my report, I talk about various ways that states owe obligations, the specific obligations states owe apply in connection with biodiversity. Let me just mention one that I've already touched on, that is that states owe duties to indigenous peoples, including to recognize their rights uh, to their ancestral territories and generally only to allow activities in those territories with their consent. Um, why is that relevant in this respect? perhaps is obvious, but just to spell it out, indigenous peoples are often the front line of defense for biodiversity because they live in the areas that are most sensitive to development and they're often the reasons why the areas are not being developed. This is a study done by the World Resources Institute um, where they actually tried to very carefully compare forest conservation in areas um, predominantly protected by or, or protected by indigenous peoples versus forest areas and areas not protected by indigenous peoples. By, when I say they did it so carefully, they tried to hold steady all other variables. So these are areas that are under similar legal regimes, they're areas that are similarly biodiverse and so forth. And what they found when they looked at this, um, these territories in three states in Latin America, Bolivia, Brazil, and Colombia, is that in every case, the, the forests that were protected by indigenous peoples um, suffered less deforestation. That indigenous people simply did a better job of protecting against deforestation than, than um, other forms of protection. And this is obvious, I think, in many ways, right? Indigenous peoples protect against this because it's their culture that's most at stake. Um, and so by protecting human rights, we protect biodiversity in that particular case. Um, I just I have to say states are doing a miserable job of this as well, right? Uh, the, the, the organization Global Witness has done a series of studies over the last several years identifying environmental defenders around the world who have been killed. Um, again, it's a fairly conservative approach. They only include people on their list. If it's clear they were killed because of their environmental activities. What they found in their first study was that 908 defenders have been killed over a 12-year period, an average of about two a week around the world. This is a problem in many places, but it's particularly present in Latin America and Southeast Asia. And again, it's particularly present with respect to the protection of biodiverse ecosystems. Um, it's getting worse. In 2015, the number had gone up to three a week. And here you can see they break out killings by indigenous peoples. The, the bright red here is killings of indigenous peoples. Um, 67 of the total 185 killings were of indigenous peoples. That's a huge percentage given what a small percentage of the total population indigenous peoples are. Um, it's getting worse again. I thought I might have another chart, but I haven't, I didn't put it in this. But in 2016, uh, Global Witness, uh, the report for 2016, Global Witness says that 200 people were killed, uh, four people, an average of four people a week around the world. So this is a global crisis. It's a clear example of how the failure to protect human rights also fails to protect the environment. Um, and so, my, my overall, my, my final message here, I guess, is that if we want to protect the environment, if we want to protect biodiversity in particular, we have to regard the biodiversity crisis also as a human rights crisis and react accordingly. Um, more information is available on my website about all of this. If, um, if you want, this is not my website. This is a website called Twitter, I believe. Um, but if you want more information, um, you can Google uh, Knox or SR Environment um, and OHCHR, and you and it will pop up. Uh, this is my Twitter page. If you want more information, I also make it available. Um, and so, um, through my Twitter post, I mainly retweet issues or retweet uh, um, posts about this, tweets about this from other sources. But that's another way of kind of following following this area. So, so on that note, again, thank you very much for inviting me to be with you, and I look forward to hearing what other people have to say. Thank you very much, Professor Knox, for a very powerful presentation. You want to do one of the first?
very much. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here also and to comment in on Jonok's work. We, we have met before and I have, of course, been following the work that is done in the uh, Human Rights Council and in the, the work of U.S. Special Rapporteur. As it happens, I spend quite a lot of time in the same house as the Human Rights Council, not in that beautiful room, but in others. I, and I will come back to that. That's part of my talk, that in addition of having done research in this area, I have been a member of what's called the Aarhus Convention Compliance Committee for 12 years. And I have been the chair of that committee since 2011, and they will have to bear with me for another four years. We recently had a meeting of the parties, which was quite controversial, particularly with the EU's compliance. But I will come back to that. So just to say that I think this is great, and I think that you are doing an excellent job in um, mapping out what is going on internationally and nationally. And I think there is an interesting mutual development uh, where the international law develops inspired by what is happening nationally, but also that national law is very much uh, influenced by what is happening internationally, so to say. So um, on, on that point, while human rights obligations are formally addressed to states, there must be ways for those individuals who should benefit from them, from go from having these rights set out in documents to actually enjoying them in practice. I think that is one of the key challenges. That can be done, and I think it is done to quite an extent by states putting pressure on one another of, of improving performance and on blaming those states who fail to do so. But there are also a lot of examples where, where there is no such pressure, and states have signed up to all kinds of documents, and they have may have been also found uh, in violation through various review bodies, but where there is still no further ways for those who have been, whose rights have been violated to push further. So my title of this was to go from having a right to enjoying a right and to point at some of the procedural dimensions. And you mentioned a few of them. And I also think that they have a very important part in the draft guidelines that you present. So, and this is, of course, where I had some, some experience. So I will say a, bit, a few words about that. And then I was also asked to say a bit, uh, some words about what is currently going on in, in my daily work, which also links into human rights, because, again, while human rights are formally addressed to states, and they could be violated by states, they could indeed also, although not formally, but they could informally be severely violated by private actors, by corporations and by states allowing them to do that or not trying to prevent them. So there is a, a strong connection, and, and so I will try to say a few words about that. So, what we see about this junction between environment protection and human rights as was described, and very much it started, you could say, some 25 years ago, very seriously. If you would pick at one specific event, it would be the Rio Conference in 1992, but this was addressed, although, of course, there were developments before that, but you can see that in all human rights, in all international environmental treaties adopted since then, there are references to public awareness and public involvement. Whereas in literally no treaty adopted before that was there any such reference. The, as a result of that, 50 states in Europe, and well, at that time it was less, but now there are 50 states ranging from Iceland in the west to Kazakhstan in Central Asia. Um, have signed up to an international treaty on uh, participatory rights. And this is very much at the junction between environment protection and human rights issues. So in which ways could members of the public move from having this right to enjoying that right? In the draft that John briefly presented, there are, these points are addressed. First of all, by having access to what is going on. You cannot participate. You cannot claim your rights if you have no idea what, what is going on. There is an interesting jurisprudence, for instance, in the European Court of Human Rights, setting out that if you're not able to assess the risks that you're exposed to, your right to privacy and family life is, is violated. So access to information is a key point. To be able to participate in decision-making related to specific activities, to plans, even to the adoption of certain regulations, is one of the uh, another point of making it possible for members of the public to also uh, ensure the substantive parts, ranging from climate change to biodiversity, other dimensions more focusing on social life or social health. And finally, 
if, if you, the authorities are not doing what they should, if the legislation that is there on paper is not implemented in practice, you need to be able to push these authorities and the private actors in the right direction by having access to adequate remedies, which could be courts, but it could also be other quasi-judicial bodies. So what this convention sets out, and um, where I think that part of the inspiration in the guidelines is from, is to, to set out certain minimum rights from these areas. And exactly as, as John pointed out, the challenge is how can you set out minimum guidelines that apply, in this case, to 50 states with very diverse political, economic, and social system. Now, at least has worked here is that in addition to setting out these rules that states sign up to and they ratify, there has also been an institutional mechanism that is intended to make sure that states do what they're supposed to do. In the human rights areas, you have uh, courts or, in, or commissions or committees who may carry out that function if members of the public bring cases to them for review. In the Oris Convention, a compliance committee is set up, which is unusual in that it cannot only be triggered by other states, but also by members of the public. And, um, and this committee has then been examining these complaints. And for instance, and this links into human rights also, uh, found states also in, uh, in, originally most states were from Central Asia and the Caucasus region, but increasingly we also found EU member states and the EU itself in violation. So for instance, if you look at what kind of risk you are exposed to, in the UK, take this as an example, they are now planning for the construction of a huge nuclear power plant. And there have, they have very advanced decision-making pro processes. Members of the public can participate, they can voice their concern, and that is taking due into account. And then at the end, there may be a decision still to build that power plant. We received a complaint from members of the public in Germany saying that we were not notified about this activity in the UK. If there will be an accident in Hinkley Point, as it's called, that may affect us. Well, we have seen here the distance from Hinkley Point to parts of Germany is not longer than from Chernobyl to where we are right now. And we have seen that, even though the likelihood is very small of, of, a, of an incident, if there is an incident in Three Mile Island, in Fukushima, in uh, Chernobyl, it could have widespread effects, and that is a big issue. And the Compliance Committee concluded that the UK had failed to, to comply with the Oris Convention because it had not duly informed members of the public, not in the UK, but in this case in Germany. And some were then a bit critical and say, okay, you found that that was the case with Germany, but how do you draw the line? Now you could say that one purpose of the Compliance Committee as with quasi judicial bodies is to set out the rules. But we say we don't need to decide that now. We only need to conclude that, at least in this case in Germany, maybe also in Ukraine, maybe elsewhere. But I think this shows that the participatory rights also have this transboundary dimension, that you may be violating your human rights to, to live in a, a, a decently unrisky sort of has this transboundary protection. I only mentioned this now. There are other parts. But again, another dimension, since I only have about one minute left, where you have the human rights dimension in a transboundary context refers to activities by private actors. In 1984, the Swedish mining company, Boliden, shipped between 20,000 and 25,000 metric tons of hazardous mining waste from Sweden to Chile. This was at the height of the Pinochet regime. This was very hazardous. This was a few years before the Basel Convention was adopted, but there were OECD decisions adopted already, setting out some basic principles on, on how to deal with hazardous waste, in particular about transboundary shipments. Now, this was sent to Chile, to the northern city of Chile in Arica, which is one of the driest places on Earth. And if you bring this soaked uh, waste to a dry area, it gets dry, and this, there's a huge pile in this city, very close, at the outside of the outskirts of the city, but close to living areas, and it was quite clear already at that time that these areas will expand. And there will be more population, very poor population working there. 
10, 50 years after these waste were disposed there, what well, Boolean argued that this was a commercial transaction, they sold it to a local enterprise for these waste to be processed in order to uh, extract arsenic, gold, and other valuable metal. Of the 25,000 metric tons, only 300 tons were actually processed, and that's the end of it. And then it was put on the ground without any coverage for more than 15 years, and it was clear that people in the area were, were being um, affected by this. And nothing happened, and nothing happened, and then seven years ago, this came to our attention, and we started to look at what can be done. Boolean has no assets in Chile. And now, uh, so we, we sued Boolean, and that was, uh, that oracle, we sued four years ago, and only three days ago we started the oral process. I won't say so much more about that, but I think it's a, it's a key point. What the people who live in this area, in Arica, in Chile, they have brought cases to their own health authorities about this pipe, successfully, but this was, health authorities are very slowly implementing it. They have sued the Chilean company, which later on went bankrupt because of this, and there are still people who are being affected. Now they want to go outside to, to do that. And again, while formally you can do that, it is an enormous project, which costs hundreds of thousands of euros to, to bring this process again. And these are some key challenges also. I mean, you, you can say that courts should be access, open to anyone, but not like the Ritz Hotel, only for those who can pay. So I realize that I've run out of time, but I think that these points that you also raise here about how can you go and enforce that are very important. Thank you very much. Thank you.